Sure, it could be a little early to start talking about Hall of Fame induction for next year, but the fact remains that this could be a big year for fans of Philadelphia baseball. Stay tuned and I'll explain. Philadelphia Baseball History presents Could 2021 be a good year for Philadelphia baseball in the Hall of Fame? So the winner of 2020, which votes for Hall of Fame induction in the year 2021, could be a big deal for Philadelphia baseball fans. And why is that? Well, every winner, the Baseball Writers Association of America votes on whether recent players should be inducted into the Hall of Fame. And in addition, at least one of the ERAs committees meets to vote on whether players who are no longer eligible to be voted by the writers nonetheless should still be inducted into the Hall. Well, this is an interesting winner because it's the first time since the Hall of Fame adopted its current system that two key ERA committees will be meeting at the same time. So let's do a quick background. The Hall of Fame adopted its most recent system in the winter of 2016. What used to be called the Veterans Committee is now called the ERAs Committee. And there are four ERAs Committees that meet on a rotating basis. There's the Early Baseball Era Committee, there's the Golden Days Era Committee, there's the Modern Baseball Era Committee, and there's the Today's Game Era Committee. Under the current rules, the Golden Days Committee meets every five years, and the Early Baseball Committee meets every 10 years. And this year is the first year that the Golden Days Era Committee and the Early Baseball Era Committee will be meeting in the same winter. The Early Baseball Era Committee considers players, managers, umpires, and executives who made their major contribution to baseball sometime up to 1949. The Golden Days Era Committee considers players who've made their major contributions between 1950 and 1969. So let's go over all the potential people who have connections to Philadelphia baseball that could be considered for induction this winter. So let's talk about those players who are going to be voted on by the writers. First, we have Shane Victorino. This is going to be his first year of eligibility. Victorino spent 12 seasons in the majors and eight seasons in a Phillies uniform. His lifetime war, or wins above replacements, is 31.5. He has a lifetime batting average of 275. He amassed 1,274 hits in his career, 108 home runs, and 489 RBIs. He also scored 731 runs and stole 231 bases. Now, if we're being honest, Victorino doesn't have Hall of Fame numbers. Most likely, he's not going to reach the 5% of votes that he needs in order to stay on the ballot for next year. So we also have Scott Rowland. He's going to be in his fifth year of eligibility. Rowland played a total of 17 seasons in the majors and 7 seasons with the Phillies. His lifetime war is 70.1. He has a 281 lifetime average with 316 home runs and 1,287 RBIs. Rowland's numbers are good, and he probably has a decent chance of eventually making it into the Hall of Fame. Last year, Rowland received 35.3% of the votes, with 75% needed in order to make the Hall. With a player like Rowland, the thing to look out for is to see if he starts gaining more and more support among the writers, and then eventually, before he reaches his 10th year, he might be voted in. Now, of the players who are eligible for the writers to vote in, this one is probably the most exciting candidacy, and that is Kurt Schilling. This is Schilling's ninth year of eligibility, so he only has this year and next year left before he drops off the list. Schilling had a 20-year career in baseball, and the team he spent the most time on would be the Phillies, which was nine years. His career war is 79.5. He has a record of 216 wins against 146 losses. His lifetime ERA is 3.46, and he has 3,116 strikeouts. Schilling is a six-time All-Star and has won the World Series three times. Schilling's candidacy has been, shall we say, controversial. And that is due to his outspoken right-wing politics. And this has been one thing that has made the voters a little bit reluctant to vote Schilling in. But his candidacy has been gaining steam. So back in the winter of 2015, which is when the writers considered induction for the year 2016, Schilling received 52.3% of the vote. Now that dropped in 2016 to 45%. That was due to a controversy where Schilling called a t-shirt that referenced the lynching of journalists awesome. 
So of course, that being fresh in the writers' minds, they held it against him. The next winter, which was the winter of 2017, he received 51.2% of the vote. In 2018, that grew to 60.9%, and then last winter, the winter of 2019, he reached 70%. So there is a chance that this winter he'll reach that 75% mark. Now some would say that Schilling's career numbers are pretty much on the low end for Hall of Fame pitchers. But Schilling is known for being a postseason beast. In 1993, for example, in the NLCS, Schilling earned the NLCS MVP despite the fact that he didn't win a single game. That series, in two games pitched and 16 innings, he had a 1.69 ERA. He kept the Phillies in both of his games, and it was just Mitch Williams falling apart that stole the wins from him. In 1993, he had that magical game five. And yeah, I'm a little biased because I happen to have been at that game. That was the incredible one to nothing complete game shutout when the Phillies had their backs against the wall down three games to one. And Schilling was famous for wearing a towel over his head that year after he'd been taken out of a game during the playoffs because of the tendency for Mitch Williams to then blow the save. So in game five, Schilling took it upon himself to pitch so well that Jim Fergosi never called on Mitch Williams. In 2001, we had the World Series after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Schilling played for Arizona and was part of that killer combination of Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson. He won the MVP for the 2001 World Series, along with his teammate Randy Johnson. With a record of one win and no losses, again earning a 1.69 ERA in three games over 21 in the third innings. 2004 was the year where they essentially had to reconstruct Schilling's foot, yet he came into the playoffs and he played even though his foot had not completely healed. That was the bloody ankle year. And in that year, Boston won its first world championship since 1915. And then finally, in 2007, Schilling was once again part of a Boston world champion team. In this person's humble opinion, it's about time for Schilling to be inducted. So let's talk about the early baseball era committee. A list of 10 candidates will be drafted up by the Baseball Writers Association of America and submitted to a committee of 16 who will then vote on the list. They can vote for as many as zero to four. And again, 75% of the vote is needed in order to make Hall of Fame induction. There are three people connected to Philadelphia baseball who I think have a decent shot of making that list. The first is Sherry McGee, outfielder for the Phillies in the early 20th century. McGee played 16 seasons in the major leagues and 11 seasons with the Phillies. He is a lifetime 59.1 war, a lifetime batting average of 291. He had 2,169 hits, hit 83 home runs, and this is during the dead ball era, and knocked in 1,176 RBIs. Now many players who've played in Philadelphia before 1938 get their Hall of Fame candidacy discounted because of the short right field porch in the Baker Bowl. The thing about Sherry McGee is that playing in the Baker Bowl really didn't have that much of an advantage for him. If you look at his home run split, for example, he's about 50-50 between home runs hit at his home park and home runs hit on the road. McGee also earned the batting title in 1916 with a 331 average. The last time McGee was considered was in 2008, where he was not, of course, elected. The next player who could be considered is Harry Stovey. Harry Stovey was a 19th century baseball player. He spent 14 seasons in the major leagues. Seven of those seasons were with the Philadelphia Athletics of the American Association. And that there is one of the reasons why his candidacy tends to be discounted. The American Association existed between 1882 and 1881. It was also known as the Beer and Whiskey League. And the American Association is considered a major league. In fact, for many years during its existence, the winner of the pennant of the American Association went on to play the winner of the pennant from the National League in the first World Series. Now, Harry Stovey was one of those players who had a combination of speed and power. Four times he led his league in runs, and three of those times he led the majors. One time he led the league in stolen bases, four times he led the league in triple, and of that, three times he led the majors in triples and four times he led his league in home runs, twice he led the majors in home runs. Stolen bases only became an official statistic six years into his career, so his stolen base statistics are a little skewed. Nonetheless, twice he led his league in stolen bases and once he led the majors. 
He ended his career with a 288 batting average. He had amassed 1,775 hits, 509 stolen bases. And again, there were six years where he wasn't credited with any because it didn't exist. And he retired with 122 home runs. What's significant is that for a good deal of time, Harry Stovey was the career leader in home runs in the major leagues. He was last considered in 2016 and missed election. Now, the last person who's connected to Philadelphia baseball, who I believe deserves to be considered for induction by the early baseball committee, is Al Reach. Al Reach was a pioneer of the creation of baseball as a sport. He was a star player at the end of the 1850s and into the 1860s. Now, he started playing in Brooklyn and was known for his time with the Brooklyn Eckfords. But in the middle of the 1860s, he became one of the first players to be paid to join a team. And that was for the Athletic Baseball Club of Philadelphia. He was paid $25 a week to play second base. And this was a time when the Athletic was growing in their ability and had become a nationally competitive baseball club. As a second baseman, Al Reach was very innovative. He was the first second baseman to play off the bag and closer to first base in order to be in a better position when the hitter hit the ball. He also played in the first professional league, the National Association of Professional Baseball Players. He played in that league from 1871 until it folded in 1875. He retired after the 1875 season and never played for the National League. Instead, because of the growing popularity of baseball, Reach invested in a sporting goods store. His store was located on South 8th Street in Philadelphia, and he made a decent amount of money, enough that when the National League wanted to expand to include a Philadelphia team again in 1883, the National League president, Abraham Mills, came to Al Reach to ask if he would become the owner of the Philadelphia franchise. So Al Reach became the first owner of the Philadelphia Phillies. Now, the 1883 Phillies were horrible. Al Reach tapped one of his old friends, another pioneer in the early days of baseball, Harry Wright, to take over the management of the Phillies. And Harry Wright turned the club around so that it was a perennial contender. Although, of course, the Phillies never won a pennant under him. Still, they had a number of great hitters. Ed Del Hanty, Sam Thompson, Elmer Flick, Nap Lajue. Al Reach also became a partner with Ben Scheib in his sporting goods business. And when Ben Scheib became the largest owner of the new American League Philadelphia Athletics, Scheib tapped Reach to be the official supplier of baseballs to the American League. And so, Al Reach became the exclusive supplier of baseballs to the American League and manufactured those baseballs in Philadelphia. His company was sold to the Spalding Company in 1927, and Al Reach passed away in 1928 in Atlantic City. Reach has been considered before, but of course hasn't made Hall of Fame induction. And it seems rather odd to me that this incredible pioneer of the early days of baseball is still not in the Hall of Fame. So the final person that we're going to talk about today is a person who could be considered by the Golden Days Era Committee. And that is Dick Allen. Now, over his 15-year career, Dick Allen batted 292 with 1,848 hits. He amassed 351 home runs and 1,119 RBIs. In 1964, he hit 318. He led the majors with 125 runs and 13 triples. He also hit 29 home runs and 91 RBIs. And in 1964, Dick Allen was the Rookie of the Year. He was a seven-time All-Star and in 1972 was the American League Most Valuable Player. His lifetime war is 58.7. And that is higher than two Hall of Famers who played during the same time as Allen. That's Willie Stargell and Tony Perez. So why isn't Allen in the Hall of Fame already? Well, that has to do with his unfair reputation, mostly pressed by Bill James as being a divider among baseball clubs. It started with an unfortunate incident in 1965 that involved Frank Thomas. Thomas was a racist jerk. And leading up to this event, which was early July of 1965, during a road trip to Los Angeles, Thomas made a reference to Dick Allen, something to the effect of, boy, aren't you gonna carry my luggage? which, as you can imagine, is highly bigoted and insulting. So during batting practice, Thomas was laying down bunts. Somebody, 
whether it was Dick Allen or Johnny Callison is not known, but somebody said to Thomas, if only you could do that 24 hours ago, because in the game before, Frank Thomas had messed up a bunt. Well, Thomas got upset and started throwing around epithets, references to Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay and Malcolm X, and they were all aimed at Dick Allen. Dick Allen got upset, and then a fight ensued. Allen wound up getting hit by a bat and was injured enough that he couldn't play that night. Frank Thomas was the one who was cut, and because of that, he was able to tell his side of the story to the media, whereas the Phillies, knowing that Dick Allen was the more valuable player, made sure that Allen was under a, a gag order, so Allen couldn't defend himself in the media. And this was the first event that started turning to Philadelphia fans against Dick Allen. We all know that the fans started booing, throwing things at him. He started wearing a batting helmet when he was playing the field. He would write things in the dirt in front of him in response to the horrible treatment that he got from the fans. And he demanded a trade, eventually being traded to the Cardinals in 1969. He came back to the Phillies in 1975 and 1976 and was a mentor to Mike Schmidt, who also was a third baseman who had to get used to playing in a city that booze its own players. Schmidt gives Allen a lot of credit and has even said that it's a lie to say that Allen divided baseball clubs. Back in the winter of 2013 was the last time that Allen was considered by the Golden Era Committee. This was the predecessor to the Golden Days Committee. At that time, Allen missed induction by one vote. The committee was scheduled to meet again in the winter of 2016. However, the Hall of Fame changed its structure during the baseball season, and it just so happened that Bud Selig had retired. So by changing the structure and having the Today's Game Committee meet in the winter of 2016, Bud Selig just happened to be elected that year. Hmm. So anyway, the Hall of Fame has an opportunity. It is an opportunity to make good and erase one of its worst slights in its history. There is a good chance that Dick Allen will finally be inducted into the Hall of Fame this winter. So as you see, this offseason has the potential of being a big winter for Philadelphia baseball fans. We could see at least two former Phillies make the Hall of Fame, and a number of other people who are connected to Philadelphia baseball receive serious consideration. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. If you have any ideas for topics that we can cover in the future, please let us know in the comments below. We have new t-shirt designs, including the Philadelphia Athletics and Harry Stovey of the American Association. And don't forget to show your pride as you protect your health and that of your family. We now have masks available in our merch store. We'll have a link in the description box below. If you would like to see more of these videos, please consider becoming a patron through Patreon. Again, we'll have a link in the description box below.